There's a lot in here, so please uh, forgive me in advance if I don't get through all of it, um, because I do want to give us an early night, including myself. But we'll see what we can do. For my own edification, and perhaps for that of others, do you mind finishing the hindrances to mindfulness? Oh, listing the hindrances to mindfulness again. How many hindrances are there? You mentioned sloth. What are the others? So you may have picked up on what the others are by now, but um, in brief, the first one is sensory desire. The second one is aversion, ill will, negativity. The third one is the sloth and torpor, so the sort of drowsy sluggishness of mind. Fourth one is restlessness and remorse, sometimes translated restlessness and worry. Um, so it includes worry as well. And the last one is doubt, which I feel can also include confusion. So I guess worry could even go in there too. But it's more of a restlessness usually, fueled by some kind of negativity. So there are the five hindrances, but there are two other, um, um, what are they called? I don't think they're apocalases, but they're more refined hindrances. And they are... Um, Arati and Tandi, which are like weariness and discontent. And these happen at sort of high, well, well, perhaps more refined stages. I mean, you can see this anyway in the mind, but they're a little bit subtler. So are, are they in the Upakalesa Sutta? I'm just trying to, I'm uh, trying to I remember. I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, because in the Upakalesa Sutta, it talks about the hindrances at quite deep stages of meditation, like when the nimitta starts to arise, the light that can come into the mind when the mind gets very still and you start perceiving the meditation object through the mind door. And some of those hindrances, I don't know, I think discontent does come in there, and also the excitement and fear that I mentioned. Um, and just not being able to rouse quite enough energy, sort of a, a sluggishness, but it's more refined. So that's quite an interesting sutta to look at. It's uh, Majjhima Nikaya 128, the Upakalesa Sutta, and it lists lots of more refined sort of obstacles at the later stages. But really it's enough if you concentrate on these five. And you'll probably notice that the third, the last three are all kind of variations on the first two. So craving and aversion is the issue here. And we're trying to find something in between there where we can just find a resting place and uh, not get pulled around so much by those winds. Yeah? So I hope that clarifies. And... I can relate to feeling the benefits of your current practice, i.e. the short happy path over the long arduous one with suffering. Oh, if only. (laughs) (laughs) That being said, you seem to have had benefits from Vipassana. Would you recommend that that retreat to someone who has not tried it yet? Why or why not? Does it fall in line with your current teaching experiences, teachings or experiences? (coughs) Um, I wouldn't say it's a matter of falling into line or not because every um, type of meditation technique will give you different... um, It kind of focuses on different parts of the mind and you'll be developing different qualities, different particular perceptions. So the question as to whether... um, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a long path full of suffering. For some people that might not be. It might be a shorter path. So... I mean, the main thing that the Buddha said was that wherever you find the Eightfold Path, there you'll find enlightened beings. So as long as you're practicing all eight limbs, the particular methods you use to develop these are not so crucial. You know, you can develop really strong mindfulness through Vipassana practice, but it must go hand in hand with right intention, right view, and all the sila, and also lead into the deep samadhi. It it should lead in that direction. I don't really see how you can get the deep, uh, enlightenment experiences without passing through the jhanas because the enlightenment experiences are so much more refined than the jhana states and why wouldn't you easily be able to get into jhanas if the mind was free from hindrances so I think all of it is you know, the same path basically we're just emphasising different aspects so whether I'd recommend it to someone or not depends who they were why they wanted to go to it um, what I felt when speaking to them yeah, some people are kind of quite fragile in a really strict regime like that of sitting sort of 12 hours a day with some sessions without moving wouldn't be very helpful. Other people might feel like really up for that. And, you know, when I started, I was young, I, I didn't mind the physical pain. And that, you know, I had a lot of time also to practice. So I did many, many retreats over 10 years or so. And so for me, it wasn't an issue to sit. I mean, the body adapted pretty quickly. So I was just really fascinated by the actual practice 
And it was a training in the perception of seeing the impermanence of phenomena. And I think this is incredibly helpful and definitely has helped me in my practice now. One of the tricky things that I find now is that I tend to notice impermanence in everything I look at. And when that is around samadhi and trying to get into deeper meditation, the object sometimes is dissolving. (laughs) And I've spoken to some really senior teachers about this who've had experience in both. And they do say this can be a phenomenon. So for me, it's taken quite a while to learn to look at the breath as a breath, just a simple breath, and be content with that breath and let it develop without starting to analyse and investigate. Mm -hmm. Not even intentionally, you know, just naturally it starts to everything dissolve. So um, I don't know, I think it's good to be able to have a few different things going on and not just train your perception to see things in one way. You know, it's useful to have different techniques to deal with different ways that the hindrances arise. So, for example, if you're having a really hard time and you're just getting depressed and a lot of anger, a lot of ill will, maybe practice metta, make that your main technique for the while, you know. It's not that you're missing out everything else. I mean, mindfulness has to be there for metta practice, wisdom has to be there, right intention, right view has to be there to some extent. So, it's really... That's why I like to teach... a to focus on the way we practice rather than what exactly we do on the cushion because if you have the right intention then you're making good mental karma and you know you are overcoming the hindrances and so insight and calm will eventually develop so some people start with insight some people start with the emphasis more on calm but basically the two things always go together like all insight practices carry a measure of calm with them because you're sustaining your attention on a particular object of meditation And all calm methods have to include wisdom because you're having to learn the way your mind's working, how to deal with your mind in different situations. You You have to have some insight into suffering to want to let go deep enough to get into calm states. So all of these things have to be involved. So I don't know. I think it's good to experiment to a degree. But then if you do find a teacher who really speaks to where you're at at this time, it can be nice to stay with that teaching for a while and see you know, go deep enough to get some genuine benefits. And then if that doesn't work for you anymore, you feel you need a different method or a different teacher, then move on, you know, or find other teachings. So, again, you know, here you've got the opportunity to meet lots of different teachings. Don't get confused by that, though. If you find a particular method that works, that's great. And you always have the suttas, right, the Buddha's teachings. So whatever you practice with other teachers, you can refer back to the suttas. Does this somehow line up? And I usually find that it does, like most teachings emphasize one or the other aspect of the Eightfold Path or of the gradual training. So it's good to have an overview of the suttas and the kind of whole um, um, gradual process that the Buddha teaches about meditation and then it's easier to see which ones fit into which part of that gradual training and which parts of the gradual training you haven't yet strengthened fully. So I hope that's not too complicated. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I hope I haven't confused you. But, um, yeah, give things a go. (laughs) I can't get the words a colleague wrote to me out of my head. Um, I'm full of contentment here, but the words still eat. Due to a benign delay and a lack of communication on a small item, I was told I lack integrity and a code of ethics, like he has. I explained the reason why that I was helping sick family members. I replied, his opinion is only his, and I let it go, until it's all I can think about here. Mm. Feel such an unreasonable harsh judgment and a male power play, how to let go of the harming, aggressive um, something. Kunud? I don't know, sometimes American English is quite different from English. What's kunud? Is that a conundrum? Is it, oh, convo, a short for conversation. Ah, convo, convo. Okay, how to let go of the harm, harming aggressive convo. Okay. So I think you're hurting. I think you're hurting. I think that's the thing. And that's why these things come up, because we haven't fully met that place that we've been hurt. You know? At first it seems like you're just irritated and angry and, you know, holding a grudge. But often it's because we haven't really fully allowed ourselves to feel the pain of being told we lack integrity or whatever it is, yeah? 
So I think first of all we need to be able to meet that and have a little bit of self-compassion. And when you're able to soothe those hurt feelings, you'll put, and, and assure yourself, you know, that I know you're good. I respect you. I respect myself. Yeah. I know I'm a person with ethics and integrity. And then maybe ask forgiveness of this person. Yeah. But most of the time, it's just about learning how to care for the way we feel. And I think on a retreat situation, you know, things that we thought were resolved, we realise are not quite resolved. <laughs> and it's just part of the process. You'll probably come here, go through all these storms about it. And when you leave, you may find that a lot of that has cleared. You know, you've processed it. But I would recommend getting underneath the anger and the, um, the pain as well, and the kind of confusion, past the stories and, you know spinning around in thoughts and just contacting the way you feel and giving yourself some care. That's what I recommend. I'm uh, not going into more depth with each question because we've got a lot of questions. When I have a free evening, ooh, nice clear writing, I will often choose to read, watch a movie, see friends, etc. rather than meditate. Is this bad? <laughs> 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 How do I balance wanting to do other leisurely things with meditating? <laughs> well, first of all, maybe just meditate a little bit, because there's no use meditate, trying to meditate a lot and then feeling really, really guilty because you just can't do it, because then you'll develop an aversive attitude to meditation. You'll think, oh no, it's something else I've got to do on my list, you know, and then that's not the right approach at all. So maybe just set aside a few minutes, you know, and... Uh, And apart from that, maybe ask yourself what it is that's motivating you to read, watch movies and see friends. Is it because it brings genuine pleasure or is there some restlessness there? If it brings genuine pleasure, that's fine. As long as you're still enjoying these things. I mean, as I said, with my practice, I found that things just dropped off the radar naturally. Like things I used to enjoy just didn't have the same pull anymore after meditating. And so I think if you do keep on with the practice, even if it's a little bit, you start to get a taste for something quieter, something more peaceful, and you'll probably find you do end up just naturally spending less time with the other things. I mean, I think seeing friends is really nice, and it's important because we need to feel supported. Um, Reading, it depends what you read. It depends what you watch as movies. I mean, movies tend to be more stimulating and exciting, so just have a look at the effect it's having on your mind. And have a look at which direction you want to go to in life. You know, do you want more stillness and peace, or do you want? Are you okay with the excitement of movies and books and all the rest? It's not that we're judging anything. You know, the Buddha's just saying, have a look in this direction. You might find something a bit deeper. So don't um, think of meditation as some kind of thing you've got to do, especially if you're a Buddhist or you come to the Buddhist insights. It's something that is a gift to yourself, actually. It's like granting yourself a moment of peace. <coughs> we really don't do that. And when we don't do that, it's like all the kind of um, uh, reverberations of life and the sort of um, unskillful thoughts, habits, actions we do, they kind of accumulate until we start to feel really kind of oppressed. And by meditating, you're sort of cleaning your mind daily. I mean, I started by, again, you know, with quite an intensive practice, I suppose, because I did start from the beginning doing an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening, <clears throat> outside of retreats. But the morning and evening are special. It doesn't have to be an hour, because after you sleep, your mind's kind of a bit disturbed by whatever dreams you might have had, maybe a bit groggy. So that's a really nice time to just wash your mind before you start the day. Set your intentions. Meet yourself kindly. And again in the evening, you know, you've been stirred up by the day's events, just 10 minutes before you go to sleep. If you haven't got 10 minutes, lie in bed, practice metta, you know, or go through the body, just do a relaxing body scan before you sleep. So there's all kinds of ways to bring meditation into daily life. Even at work, in the office, you can have five minutes. You take an extra five on the toilet and tell the boss you're constipated. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a you know the Buddha said retreat to a small place, a secluded place, <laughs> like a cave or a cootie. <laughs> so a cave or cootie, they have toilets, I suppose. 
<laughs> so that's your cave and cootie. Ajahn Brahm told me a story about someone who, um, whose secretary used to lock the boss in the office. And not in the office, in their cupboard in the office. <laughs> she used to literally say to the boss, go in the cupboard, I'm going to lock the door and meditate for half an hour. I guess he wanted to, otherwise he'd have probably sacked her, but that was the way she got him to do it. (laughs) So there's all kinds of ways you can bring it in, right? And it's not only sitting on the cushion, remember, it's watching the way that you're getting pulled and the defilements are getting, well, I don't like the word defilement, unwholesome, unskillful, unbeneficial, unhelpful states of mind are being triggered by the sense impressions. So check that out, you know, check that out and guard and protect your mind. And then when you do meditate, it'll be a little bit easier and you'll have a better relationship with it. So I hope that helps. Bye. A lot of questions. Is there ways to practice Buddha's teachings? Hmm? Within the law? No. Within the loo? No. Oh, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Something the something. I mean, it doesn't sound like a personal question. Would anybody like to tell me what it says? Whoever wrote it? Is there a way to practice Buddha's teaching written? Written? I don't know. Okay, well, if anyone wants to... Okay, you can try and read it. And if if the person who wrote it would like to ask verbally... Go ahead, otherwise I have to skip it. I think we should just... All right, let's carry on. How can we develop more trust and vulnerability? Uh, Do do you want me to read this? Do you know what it says? I can read read this. What do you think it says? It says, "Is, is there ways to practice Buddha's teachings um, when... When the when the law or when the the last word I don't understand. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think we should just all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna carry on because we don't have all night. Okay. How can we develop more trust and vulnerability? So that's interesting that trust and vulnerability are, are put together here. You mean trust in others, trust in yourself, trust in the teachings? I'm not quite sure. But vulnerability is a very strong quality, actually. People think it's sometimes being weak, but it's actually an incredible strength. And for me, I think it's just, again, about contacting the way I really feel and having a lot of sensitivity and care and compassion for that. So really taking care of my own feelings first, respecting them, giving them some respect, and then perhaps being able to enter a situation where I'm feeling afraid or I'm feeling intimidated or unloved and just turn up there. But I have to keep in contact with my body and my feelings and I have to keep that sense of like really respecting and caring for myself. And then I can go into that situation and really be honest and just say, I'm feeling nervous, I'm feeling vulnerable. And I have done this. I have done this in certain situations where I realised that the, other, the only other choice was to close up and I didn't want to do that. It's not like me, actually, to do that. I'm quite an open person. And uh, I, for me, it's more, much more painful to close off to, <coughs> and to close off to my feelings. So I realised it was my only choice and it was really wonderful because I gave others in that situation the gift of being vulnerable. And one of the other nuns there, she came to me a month or so later with something that she felt bad about that she felt might have hurt me and she said, I'm coming to you to tell you the truth because you've shown me how to be vulnerable. And I felt so pleased, so happy. So in that sense, I guess the trust came through being real because being vulnerable is being real. But obviously you don't want to open up to just everybody, right? We're not sort of going out there and telling everybody our life story without knowing them a little bit. So I think, you know, again, becoming more sensitive to yourself helps you to become more sensitive to others too. Um, And you may just get an intuition that with this person I can open up a little bit, you know. 
But I think in relationship it should never be one-sided, completely one-sided, that you're doing all the opening up and the other person's, you know, not, <laughs> not doing any. So respect your limits and don't, uh, don't force yourself. Yeah? It's always about being gentle and being real. Is your family supportive? Hmm. I wonder in what way. Is my family supportive? <laughs> I would say probably they are pretty supportive. If they're listening, they probably want me to say they're really, really supportive. And uh, they are in their way. I mean, I really admire the way they've come round to my life decisions because it wasn't the obvious thing to do, you know, being born in a small town in England and... You know, going off to India at 19 and saying, that's it, I'm going, I've got no return ticket, I've got 200 quid, I'm going, you know. That must have been really tough. And I did mention to my mum after, like, one or two retreats that I was going to ordain. But she seems to have sort of not quite um, registered that, because it was ten years later that I did ordain, and she seemed quite shocked. (laughs) <laughs> but I had been telling her and I think my path had been moving that way maybe one of the things that um, was a sort of red herring was that I came back to England at a point and, and studied Indian medicine, Ayurvedic medicine I did a degree in London it was the first one actually available outside of India and over there you had to pay for it And anyway, so I could get a student loan and I hadn't found a monastery and I was 27 and I thought well, you know, what am I going to do I still haven't found a monastery after all these years Maybe I should just do this degree, and then it's a backup. But guess what? After one year of the degree, I heard about my monastery. So I did finish my degree, but then I ordained. In fact, I ordained in the second year, after the second uh, year of the degree. So I think that was difficult. But um, over time, I mean, they've always come to see me, and they've always taken an interest in what it's about. And I think one of the things that's helped them the most is meeting other people, Um, who are on this path and seeing the kind of people I associate with and realising they're really good people. Um, Also, my parents are quite open-minded, so I am able to communicate sort of some of the deeper aspects of what it's about. Not quite about cessation and, you know, non-self, maybe not that far. (laughs) But, you know, at least about kindness and, and things that open the heart, you know. And I think now that I'm starting my project in England, I'm trying to develop a, a nuns monastery for fully ordained nuns and to give other women the opportunity, because there's nothing like that yet. And I'm doing it kind of on my own, like I'm the only nun. And um, I started it. I started the project before we had even a trust. <laughs> so I'm like, come on, everybody, we need people to help me. Um, and I think they're quite proud of that, because it's something concrete. You know, It's something they can see that it's doing good in the world. So, yeah, they talk to me, they try to offer support in their own way. Um, they, they come to some talks with Ajahn Brahm. They, they came to Burma, they came to India. <laughs> so my parents are pretty good. Yeah. While meditating, I felt a giddy joy and my breath became very shallow, almost imperceptible. I've heard of this happening and I was not alarmed. But, with the breath and the pleasure of breathing as my object gone, I was not sure if I should keep the breath as my object or switch to some other method. (laughs) In that moment, how should you handle this? Very nice question. Okay, this is the doubt that comes up for people at this stage. And the answer is, just keep developing contentment. Don't move on to anything else. Because it takes a lot of work to get to that stage and you've already pacified a lot. And the mind's having to get used to a much subtler experience. So the mindfulness hasn't yet grown strong enough to really know what's going on. So it's kind of pre nimitta stage. So in that kind of um, experience, just stay with whatever the mind wants to stay with. If the breath isn't really perceptible, then stay with the mental pleasure. You know, there must have been some sort of mental pleasure, maybe not strong pleasure yet, but at least some sort of calm. So just try and develop stillness with that, contentment with that, and just patience. <coughs> not thinking about it developing or getting anywhere else, just what Ajahn Brahm calls waiting on the moment rather than waiting in the future. He has all these really great little uh, catchphrases. So you wait on the moment, it's like you dote on the moment, you just really give it everything. 
And you don't ask anything of that moment. You don't ask that it develops or grows. You just stay there. So that's what you can do. And in your daily life and with the practice in general, keep on developing the wholesome happiness because at this point when the mind's still, that's when the next object will be the happiness. So you want to get a familiarity with those subtler types of happiness. So just stay there and let mindfulness grow is the answer. Hope that helps. Did you see how beautiful the full moon is tonight? Thank you very much. That's my name. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I didn't. I didn't know it was the full moon. But thank you for asking. I haven't actually been outdoors today. So if everybody wants to have a look outside afterwards, maybe you can see the full moon. <laughs> Dear Venchana, could you please briefly talk about your previous teacher in Burma? <laughs> um, <laughs> after your Goenka ten-year adventure, what did you learn? How did your practice deepen? Oh, hang on, how many questions is this? <laughs> um, and did it shift after meeting Ajahn Brown? What are your practices now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, my practices now are what we did today. And I just talk about it in different ways. So every retreat I teach, I just choose a different word, whether it's contentment or letting go or silence or um, giving or non-self or it's all the same. <laughs> I just try to rearrange it. <laughs> <laughs> so <that's, laughs> but I'm going to go smart and keep giving the same talk soon because it's yeah. Anyway, so that's how I practice. You know, um, I'm more I'm more interested now in pacifying and developing deeper samadhi because I got to the place with my previous practice that it was a kind of plateau and I could see everything dissolving, impermanent. You know, nothing there like sand falling down a bank, but the next stage is supposed to be stream entry and it wasn't happening (laughs) and anyway I got really sick so I had to leave Burma so that was really difficult Um, could I talk about my teacher he was amazing my Burmese teacher he was wonderful and I guess what attracted me to him initially was that he'd been practicing the method that I was doing and that had worked for me but he'd you know actually broken through so he'd got some very deep wisdom Of course, this is a matter of taking things on faith, but when the people around him know and the teachers who were there at the time know and, you know, the disciples know, they teach at a certain level, there's a pretty good chance. Plus, this teacher had been in very, very deep jhanas from the age of about 14. Like, he'd been sitting for three days at a stretch in his teens, you know, without going to the toilet, without eating anything. And he'd come out afterwards and tell his teacher... These and these people are coming today. They're going to bring this and this food. They'll be wearing this and this. So he had all these psychic powers, really incredible mind and really incredible samadhi. So he was ordained at the age of five. I mean, in Burma, this is quite common, right? But I guess a lot of people are there and they sort of, it may not turn out to be their vocation, but for him, he obviously has some skill, maybe from a previous life. So he already had all that and then (coughs) went to the Vipassana method. So I had confidence that, you know, I guess that was the first time I realised that, hmm, it seems that Samadhi's making a big difference here as to the depth of insight possible. And he was full of metta, really full of metta, so that you'd sit in the hall with him and I would just feel showered. It was really incredible. It was like starting from the place of PT every time. And, um, And because of his, I suppose, ability to sort of read people maybe a bit, even though he spoke Burmese, there was like a... He would give talks that were exactly the things I've been thinking about that day. I mean, very specific things. And every day at the end of the talk, there was another English nom. And we'd say, gosh, this is incredible. Can you believe it? We're getting personal guidance. It really felt like being in the time of the Buddha. I mean, it was a very royal monastery, very quite hard to get to and nobody really knew about it we had no electricity the Dhamma Hall didn't even have a door when I went there or windows a uh, huge amount of mosquitoes and we slept on like little tatami mats and so it was really you know aus- austere 
But the meta and the guidance that we had was just incredible. And I always still to this day thank him because I think without having ordained with such a person, I would maybe not still be in the robes. But he asked me actually when I met him, he said, if you ordain, is it for life? And I just said yes. And there was no pressure there. I could have disrobed any time. But I think it gives it a power, you know, to be ordained by such a being and to have that confidence and to have made that commitment. So it was very wonderful, but sadly I had to leave. <laughs> so that was hard, but luckily I found another teacher who I had equal faith in. So, um, And it, it came at the right time in my practice. So... Um, so what I learned was that I, you know, it would be good to deepen samadhi and maybe with a very gentle approach because I wasn't that great at anapana, I must say, when I had to focus here and focus on the breath and keep bringing it back and keep bringing it back. For me, that was so tiresome and boring. And as soon as my mind could go through the body and start looking at what was going on and how the body and mind interacted, that was fascinating. I loved that part. But the anapana was really just quite dull. I did do some sort of, you know, longer periods of Anapana in Burma and I started to get quite still. And I remember at that time thinking, Samadhi is not concentration. It's a kind of stillness. It's much softer than concentration. So I had that kind of sense. But um, then when I heard Ajahn Brahm's teachings, they just resonated really deeply. And um, my practice in theory... I guess could have continued to build, but I've had a very complicated non's life since then because I couldn't settle really in Perth. And I couldn't really... Well, because Ajahn Brahm's monastery is for monks, right? (laughs) And the non's monastery is 100 kilometres away. We hardly got any teachings. We hardly got to see him at all. And I wanted... Maybe because I'd been spoiled in Burma, but I wanted that teacher-student relationship because I saw the difference it made. And so somehow I've forged that with him, but it's in a very different way. It's all, it's around practice, certainly, and also around a lot of service. So, yeah, so it's been an interesting path, but I feel incredibly grateful that I've got the opportunity to develop myself in both, because one of the things that I loved about Ajahn Brahm immediately was that not only did he have this depth of practice and wisdom, he also had this indefatigable ability to serve just constantly, without any sort of regard for his own comfort or discomfort, he would just be serving, 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 out of loving kindness. So I think this is incredible, and um, the path may take longer because of the project, but what was it? An African proverb, I think, said something like, um, if you want to go quickly, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. So hopefully that's what will happen. <laughs> Gosh. <clears throat> There's another quickly on here. <laughs> do you mind quickly listing or... Do, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> do you mind quickly listing or... Something... Detail? Uh, them. Oh, hang on. It might start here. You stated that the Buddha, quite poetically and... Incantatorily stated that certain mind state leads to results like rain, water flows from the mountains to the sea. What are the mind states? Ah, okay, they were not entirely clear for me. From what I gathered, you were discussing among them virtue or virtuous living, herein defined as fidelity to the Eightfold Path. Is this so? Um, not exactly, but sort of. I wanted to see what stayed with me and what was left. Okay, so you asked me to quickly go through them again. Okay, so basically there's a sequence, and there are two different sequences. Actually, there are a lot, but the two that I sort of tend to focus on and teach from are the one which, one starts from suffering, and that leads, like rain, leads into the creeks, from suffering to confidence, from confidence to joy, from joy to rapture, from rapture to tranquility, tranquility to deep happiness, from deep happiness to samadhi, and from samadhi it goes into seeing things as they really are, and then um, disenchantment, fading away, um, and I think in that one, liberation and knowledge of liberation. <clears throat> the other one's the same, except it starts from virtue, um, from virtue to non-remorse, and then to joy. And the same thing, from joy to rapture, rapture to tranquility, tranquility to happiness, 
happiness to samadhi, deep stillness. So always there's this link between happiness and deep stillness. It's the proximate cause. So as long as we're getting into this joy, somehow or other, we have to get into the joy through confidence, through virtue, through reflecting on our goodness, reflecting on our, you know, reflecting with gratitude about everything we have in our lives, our good friends, whatever it is, practicing loving kindness. So we get into the joy and then from there it takes off naturally. And actually, we, we, you know, sometimes it says, oh, you don't have to make the volition to get to the next stage. But it's even more than that, I'd say, that when we interfere too much, we don't get to the next stage. It, it's like there's too much ego and striving there. So it's more like putting the causes in place and allowing the effects to, to happen. Because yeah? to get still, you have to sort of get out of the way. You have to stop interfering too much and just let things settle. So I hope that um, reminds you of the sequence. <clears throat> what was this building before, or built for rather? Thank you. Well, I think this building was a Christian or Catholic monastery. So Do you want to say something yeah. about that? Yeah, just, just in brief? Just very briefly. Um, so, uh, originally, this building was built by a person who was just an ordinary householder, um, and it was a replica of an old building in France. Um, but shortly afterwards, um, he donated it to the uh, Order of Augustinian Monks. Um, so it was a Catholic monastery for 60 or 70 years. Um, and then a few months ago, they sold it to us, and now it's a Buddhist monastery. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay, this is a really good question. How can you distinguish insight from thoughts when meditating? <coughs> That's really good. Sometimes thoughts are kind of clever and wise and they may solve problems in the world, but that's not the insight that the Buddha was talking about. The way you can determine what is really insight and what is not is that insight should lead to peace. So when there's insight into something, it should lead to deeper stillness, a deeper sense of understanding. And also it should overcome the hindrances. So if there's really insight into, say, the cause of restlessness, once you see the cause, the work's done usually. You can try and remove it, but usually once you see the cause, it automatically, you stop fueling that cause. So insight is what sort of clears the path, I would say, into deeper stages of meditation. And Ajahn Brahm also says that insight is um, something that shocks you. It's not something you already know. But he's talking about the really deep insight. That's why I quote him, because I don't have such deep insight. But he said, you know, even though you think you know what non-self, impermanence and suffering mean, you really don't. We only know it partially. The Buddha said, you know, that if you fully understand dukkha, if you fully understand it, then you attain stream entry. So there's something we haven't fully understood yet. We have to understand suffering in its entirety. So insight is... Uh, everybody thinks they're wise. <laughs> so thoughts generally when meditating are not particularly helpful. I mean, you can sometimes use a little bit of a thought just to direct your mind a certain way. Like you could say calm. Or you could say, like you can program your mindfulness in the beginning. Or, for example, you could use thoughts of loving kindness to develop meta meditation. But generally, I think with thinking, it's okay to have it there, but just let it kind of fall off the edges of the screen, so to speak. Don't invest too much energy into it, because it can take a lot of uh, our time and energy. And thoughts never really get you very far. Most of the time, deep insight is born of silence. <coughs> otherwise all the great philosophers would have been enlightened and a lot of them were actually just driven crazy by their philosophies and some of them committed suicide so you know there are a lot of people who can think a lot more um, precisely than us and they're not enlightened you mentioned being a big music fan in your layperson days almost always have a song I almost always have a song in my head Sometimes two at the same time. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> no, 
Not exactly at the same time, right? Or between each other. That's interesting. See, I'm still a musician. Okay. <laughs> I figure this must be my comer for having clung to music for so many years. Yes. Not exactly comer, but yes, if you think of comer as effect. Yeah. Comer is not like a punishment. Comer just means action. So whatever you did before now is having its effect. So you've put that music in your mind and now it's um, playing back to you because you wanted it, so you put it in. So the Buddha says um, in the Vitaka Santana Sutta, he says, whatever we frequently um, pon- think and ponder upon becomes the inclination of our mind. So if you're like, hey, baby, for like years and years, then hey, baby, comes up in your meditation. <laughs> 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 so it's just the sort of reverberation. <laughs> For the first, if it's any consolation, for the first two years of my practice, and in there I did probably about seven or eight retreats and about the same in serving, I had a constant jukebox. I just had a constant jukebox, and not even of good stuff, of really crappy pop music. It was so annoying. The stuff that I really didn't think I'd listen to, and I knew all the words. So it does start to subside, it really does, yeah. But you'll notice it's the same thing if you watch a kind of... Like, if your mind's sensitive... And you watch, say, a really kind of, what's the word? I don't know, horrible movie, really. Because they are quite horrible, aren't they? They're a bit, mm-hmm. you know, like all these sights and sounds. And, you know, it can just go on and on in your mind after that. And, and it's like, it's really painful. So don't worry. I mean, you will, um, it will subside. But you're not being punished, if that's what you meant by karma. Can you offer tips for practicing with this? Just try and be patient. Just patient. You know, again, just like the, there's different ways that the Buddha talks about in that sutta. One of them is to ignore the thoughts. That might be the best thing because you can't really stop it at this point. So I think just ignore it. Don't give it a lot of energy and attention, and try to remain with your meditation object. Yeah, maybe maybe the body is a good one to remain with because it's a feeling object rather than um, anything that's going to add words. <laughs> But another thing that is helpful if you do have a lot of thoughts in your mind is metta because it's a direct substitution for the maybe not very helpful thoughts. And you can actually, you know, your mind's a bit energised and restless and active anyway, so why not use a different thought? So substitution's also a way. But I think generally you've just got to let it subside in its own time. Yeah. In a more spiritual life, what role should secular music play, if anything? It's entirely up to you. I am not going to tell you how much music to listen to. Sorry. It's also because we're running out of time. <laughs> okay. I will try and answer them, though. Ooh. Friday night or at around 9.28pm. You <laughs> stated that the Buddha mentioned there were three forms of comparisons. Yes. Less than thinking I am inferior. Yes. Greater than thinking I am superior. And equal thinking I am the same. Yes. However, you went on to say that equal is problematic because we're all different. Yeah, thanks for asking that, because that's not the real reason why it's problematic. I mean, it's problematic because we're thinking that I am anything. This is the actual problem. We're thinking in terms of a self. This is the actual real problem. I only said that we're all different because that can help us to um, stop thinking in those terms, stop measuring. You know, If we just realise we're all different, what's the point trying to compare in any way? But the reason the Buddha said it isn't because we're all different, it's because we're thinking in terms of a self, and that's the mistake. However, isn't different by definition? Yes, yes, exactly. Another comparative term, yes. But we can't go to the ultimate reality before we've tried to overcome the kind of coarser misunderstandings that we have. So they're just kind of ways of perceiving that are a little bit closer to the truth. The argument or logic of the argument, yes. Um... Was the Buddha pointing to a larger or deeper... No, he wasn't pointing to a larger or deeper interdependence. No, he wasn't. This is another mistake, actually, that people make about interdependence. I don't think the Buddha anywhere said that we're actually interdependent. He said that, yes, you know, everything, every cause has an effect. So, of course, somebody else's actions may hurt us or harm us or have an effect that, you know, their behaviour affects us in some way. But what he did talk about was... um, Dependent origination, which is a causal chain of, um, what would you say, of of arising. So a chain of, uh, how would you say, 
cause and effect that relates to our self. It's about how suffering arises within our self. It's not about how it connected to everyone else. So personally, I don't think the Buddha taught interdependence in the way that I'm understanding this word. But he definitely said that, you know, we should develop compassion to all as to ourself, metta to all as to ourself, etc., etc. So we should always care for others as we care for ourselves. So in that sense, our effects, our, our actions affect others. So yes, in that sense, we're interdependent. Anyway. How can loving kindness help us with family members who do things that hurt themselves or others? It can help you. Loving kindness helps you. And when you develop a mind of loving kindness, you naturally have an effect on others. Unfortunately, we can't practice loving kindness to change others, really, because then it's another kind of bargaining. We can only practice loving kindness to change ourselves. So we have to change our own heart into a heart of love, unconditional love. And then when you have a family member who hurt, who's hurting themselves, you'll be able to truly love them. And you'll be able to say, you know, I love you. I, I hope that, you know, you're able to stop hurting yourself. But I love you and accept you, no matter what. And that may be what they need to start to come out of it. Yeah. Sometimes one person's love can affect another and actually give them the sense that they are worthy, that they are valuable, and that they deserve more than harming themselves. So it's always a beautiful thing to do, and it protects you from getting burned out if you're in a helping role. Because loving kindness is a protection, you know, it keeps your mind positive. And also, it doesn't mean you can, like, go in there and just help that person constantly and get worn out. It also means you'll know when to stand back and look after yourself. So again, loving kindness is to yourself equally as to that family member. So I would definitely recommend that kind of practice in this context. And share those thoughts of loving kindness with this person. You know, because it works, actually. People feel it. Like I just said about my teacher, I could feel it. I mean, it was really obvious. There was one time that myself and my other non-friend we're sitting in meditation. Again, you know, these long sittings. We're there from about one till five. And at the end of the sit, we both came to each other. And our teacher had been away. And I said to her, Saido came back. I could feel it at about three o'clock. Did you feel anything? She said, yes, I had the same feeling. I could feel this meta just come over me about halfway through that sitting. And he had come back. We could start to experience that energy. I mean, if that sounds incredible, it's not really, because if you imagine that we had no other input, we were just sitting every day yeah, in this very quiet place. I mean, you're just tuned up energetically. You know, you're so sensitive to, to the energy of the place and to each other. And these are powerful beings. So meta works. Meta works. Can you speak about how to give metta, <laughs> emotional or physical? We are going to do a metta session at the end of the day tomorrow, by the way, uh, to help others while keeping oneself grounded, safe and unharmed. Hopefully I just said something about that. Especially in New York City, there are a lot of people with deeply troubled or aggressive energies. One might wish to help but not realise until it's too late that they've been harmed. Correct. So metta practice is a, is a specific practice. It's usually started with thinking, using certain thoughts to start to generate a feeling of metta. So the thoughts aren't the metta, but the thoughts are a kind of direction that you're pointing your mind into. So after saying a thought of metta, like, may you be happy, may you be well, may you be safe, may you be peaceful, whatever you want. I mean, I have my own four phases. You have to find four that resonate for you, or two, or one. And then listen, listen to where that's pointing. So you say the words of metta and then you, you're silent and you just stay with your body, stay with your heart and carry on, carry on. It's like a meditation object. So the thought that you put in there is like, in a way, like if you're doing breath meditation, the breath is there. So here the thoughts are like your breath. So each, each thought is your meditation object. In between the thoughts you listen to where that's pointing the mind. That's in very brief. Um, 
And of course, you can start with yourself and build that up quite significantly. Then you can start with a loved person or a benefactor and then a neutral, a disliked person in that way. So I think Meta for Yourself is enough, actually, in this context, if you want to get through New York City. <laughs> you need a protective field around you. Um, how to, in general, how to draw boundaries from a Buddhist perspective. Um, again, the all as to oneself, I think, um, because when the metta is equal between yourself and others, you notice when you're uh, moving out of your um, sphere of wellness, you know, you're moving out of balance. I mean, it's not easy. But yeah, boundaries also, I mean, for myself, I just try and tell myself that I'm not going to be able to serve others if I get worn out. So I take rest because I know that if I don't, I won't be able to continue with the project. So you're taking, but you know, I try to tell myself that to be boundaried is not to be selfish. I'm not the best at boundaries, so this is why I use that kind of rationale to myself. <laughs> Otherwise, I do get quite burned out. There is one more question on there, but I'm going to answer someone else's because there are lots of people who've asked. Lately, I've been experiencing a lot of despair and hopelessness. When I practice accepting these states, I find I dwell and wallow in the discontent. How do I accept the suffering and also let it go? Yeah. Mm, It depends how long you're dwelling and wallowing, I suppose. I mean, I think they need to be met. But if you find that your mind is so sort of weak that by meeting them you're just sort of reinforcing them in some way, or they're getting ingrained, then I think to do some meta meditation or compassion, self-compassion. So with compassion, it's not only meeting the suffering, it's also focusing on the wish to be free from suffering. So you meet it and you say, you know, okay, I know I suffer, I, I feel the suffering, you feel it. But then you say, may I be free from suffering, and you focus on that wish to be free. That's the part which makes compassion pleasant. So this is another thing. How do I accept and let it go? You can't do both at once. You have to accept it first. When you really accept it, it starts to fade. Sometimes we want to accept it in order for it to go away, and that's not real acceptance. So there's no way around meeting things. But I would say don't stay with them too long. Stay with it for short periods of time. If you're really wallowing, get up, do walking meditation. But definitely do some metta practice during the day as well. I would say make that a part of your everyday practice. Yeah, And also the self-compassion. Talking to yourself kindly too. Even if you're not on the cushion, just talking to yourself kindly. Like, hey, you did really well tonight. Well done. I have to say that to myself after my talks. You know. (laughs) All right. How are we doing for energy? Are we okay? Mm-hmm. Is stream entry a semi-reasonable aspiration for a lay practitioner? Semi-reasonable. <laughs> 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 it's great, but don't you know? It doesn't mean that if you aspire, you'll get it in this life. But why can't we aspire? Why can't we have that as a goal? Yeah, I don't see why not. Some lay practitioners are more committed than some monastics. It's a matter of time, how much time you have, how committed you are, what you've done in the past perhaps, the teachers that you happen to come across, the teachings. It's really important to have the word of another, Paritha Gosa, the Buddha said that there are two factors for stream entry, seeing things as they really are and the word of another. Or is it work of the mind that goes back to the source? Yeah, the same thing, Yoni So Manisikara. So being able to penetrate deeply into the arising of things, where things are coming from, and the word of another, which means the word of someone who's enlightened or someone who knows the path. So that's why I love to teach from the suttas, because we need to hear what the Buddha said, because we're conditioned a certain way, and our conditioning is basically leading us to suffering (laughs) most of the time. So we need to hear that there's a different way. So we need a different seed planted in our mind. And once you've heard that seed, there's something about some intuitive sense that that's leading in a different direction to freedom. So yes, why not? But don't push for it, because that's ego. (laughs) What really even is it, and what does it require? 
so I said the two things that are factors of it. Obviously, the Eightfold Path. What it really is, I think it's the first experience of Nibbana, actually. Seeing that things, all things that are conditioned are subject to cessation. Seeing that. That means seeing them cease. So it's a very deep experience. And it's something that is an experience, it's an event, it's not just a state of mind of, oh, right now I'm not taking anything to be a sense of self. That's not stream entry. Um, you know, open awareness without defilements is not stream entry. That's not Nibbana here and now. Stream entry is something that in the Vinaya is said to be an event. And when you're questioned on whether this has really happened, the question is when and where did it happen? So it's something very deep. So don't worry about that yet, but just see, is it going in the right direction? Are you moving towards peace, letting go? Yeah, insight. Are you moving in that direction? And keep checking your understanding against the suttas or against a teacher who you have confidence in. Yeah? Good. Has anyone calculated travel... Time and distance of all the areas the Buddha was alleged to have taught. Hmm, probably. Probably someone like Bhante Sajato. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he must have walked a long way. From common sense, it seems he could not have been in so many places at the same time. Seven years under a <coughs> Bodhi tree. Not seven years, seven weeks, wasn't it? Seven, six weeks? Six weeks? Seven weeks after enlightenment? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Seven years, six years he was practicing the ascetic practices. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Um, so in total he had 45 years, and if you look yeah. at a map of the areas in India he went, they were all very close to each other. So it's not yeah. even remotely, it's, it's not out of the realm of reason. In fact, it's very, very reasonable um, yeah. for him to have gone to all those places. and. Oh, yeah. Also, if you read the suttas, he spent most of his time in Savati. Uh, yeah. He did travel around to other places, but he actually yeah. spent most of his time in Savati. Yeah, and he didn't go to Sri Lanka, I'm afraid, in case there are any Sri Lanka people here. Because there are all these things that, you know, a lot of Buddhists think, well, he came to our country, he came to that country, but I don't think so. <laughs> well, he didn't, actually, sorry to say. Well, that's another question. That's another question, okay, but ask, yeah. There's no evidence, I don't think, that the Buddha went to Sri Lanka. <laughs> He'd have probably had to swim. <coughs> or fly. Or fly through the air. I mean, he may have astral travelled. That could be possible. I wouldn't rule that one out. If my teacher can see who's coming, and he could see what was happening at the Shwedagon too, and his monastery was a long way from the <coughs> Shwedagon pagoda. So this is quite normal in countries like Burma. Though a lot of people have these abilities. It's talked about quite casually, actually. Would you please clarify the meaning and purpose of sense restraint? Yes. I don't like the word sense restraint. It means indriya samvara. It, I guess samvara is a kind of restraint, but I kind of more like governing the senses or protecting the senses. Because it's not about not looking at things and restraining ourselves from looking at things. It's more about learning to look in a way that doesn't generate unwholesome states. So it kind of circles around mindfulness because you need mindfulness to know what's arising depending on how you look at things. But it's also very, very similar to right effort of the Eightfold Path. So again, it precedes mindfulness both in the gradual training and in the Eightfold Path. So right effort, again, is about keeping out unwholesome states. And the, one, the unwholesome states that are in your mind, asking them to leave... And then keeping in the wholesome states and actually increasing them, developing them. Paripunnam, is it? Or I don't know. Bringing them to fulfilment. Yeah. So that's basically what it's about. And it's to protect your mind from getting kind of swept away in the world and, and just finding that you're all wound up in a tangle. Just like that string <laughs> from the microphone. <laughs> So it's kind of like maintenance of the mind, <laughs> yeah. servicing it so it doesn't get in a tangle. And then you sit on your cushion and it, you're just a mess because then you know, <coughs> the meditation time's gone and you haven't enjoyed it at all. So it's really important and it's part of sila. It's uh, the mental part of sila. It's uh, good mental conduct. Yeah? And it has the, um, what the Buddha called um, 
unblemished happiness. Unblemished. Okay. My brother stole my identity, part of my something, and took money. He has acted aggressively, cruelly, and claims to feel entitled because he took care of me financially in my early 20s. I understand he's suffering, so that's what he's giving, and that's this situation can help me grow spiritually, however it still hurts. That's very painful. I can't imagine how painful that must be because it's also the betrayal, isn't it, of a family member. So again, self-compassion, first of all. Yeah. How do I feel a sense of justice in this situation? I'm not sure what you mean about justice. I mean, I don't personally think that punishment is very helpful. There is a really rude phrase, actually, that my teacher said, but maybe, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. <laughs> he says, don't worry about punishment. Come and we'll get the bastards anyway. <laughs> but he never publishes that because it's a joke, OK? He's supposed to laugh. <laughs> anyway, it is a joke. <laughs> so leave that up to Kama. Leave that up to, you know... His, his path. Maybe if he is brought to trial, then something will happen. But I think it's about caring for your own feelings. And I would say also the practice of forgiveness. There's some very nice phrases you can pick up. You can ask forgiveness. I mean, you don't have to say this to another person. You can practice it on your meditation cushion. So the ones I like to use are like, um, um, if anything I've done by body, speech or mind intentionally or unintentionally, knowingly or unknowingly, unknowingly, has hurt or harmed anyone, I seek forgiveness. And then if anybody else has hurt or harmed me, knowingly or unknowingly, intentionally or unintentionally, by body, speech or mind, I grant them forgiveness. In difficult situations, you could say, may I learn to forgive them. Yeah. And then the last one's really nice because it's about self-forgiveness. If there's anything I'm not yet ready to forgive, I forgive myself for that. Mm. <laughs> so that's really nice because that talks about forgiveness as a process. And I think that might be helpful here. Because you may never understand how <coughs> he's behaved and why he's behaved that way. You may not even have the chance to talk and it might not help. To talk, but at least you can do a lot of um, healing within yourself. Okay, it's after nine, so I would like to offer that people who are tired can uh, go to bed, and I will not be longer <laughs> than another 15 minutes. So if anyone wants to stay for another 15 minutes, you may. And if all of you go to bed now, then I should also go to bed. <laughs> so if you'd like to leave, please do. Otherwise, we'll end at 9.20. And you'll still have more than eight hours to lie on your bed. Good night. So now I'm going to get to know who asked the questions. <laughs> 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 okay. Why is form impermanent? I don't understand this question. Why is form impermanent? Is not enlightenment found in emotional turmoil, not political like mindfulness? I don't understand that question, but enlightenment is found by seeing the impermanent, not self and suffering nature of body and mind. So I don't think there's, um, I don't know what political mindfulness means. <laughs> Hopefully your mindfulness is, is more objective than political, I don't know. Just add some kindness. <laughs> okay. All right, so just to make things a little settled,
If anyone wants to leave, please leave now. And otherwise we'll have another 10, 15 minutes. Someone wants to enter at the back, a ghost wants to enter. <laughs> okay. I consider myself blessed for having the basic stable conditions to live without a problem. However, I have the tendency of complaining about everything, especially in my relationships. My attempts of building a romantic relationship have failed due to the repetition of this dysfunctional pattern. I'm wondering why this habit pops up automatically and also would like to know how to eliminate the feeling of discontent. Yeah. I mean, it happens automatically because that's the way you've been conditioned, so please don't take the blame for it. You know, these things are, are, are to do with what we've grown up around, the way other people have spoken to us, the way we've heard other people speaking. Um, my family are quite good at complaining so I also have a tendency to like worry and see the faults in things and I know that's from you know because my family are a bit of a, a worry worrier types not warrior but warriors <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know I think we have to accept ourselves first of all I mean over time it does change it's about, it's also about surrounding yourself by wise people people who are maybe more positive you know, who kind of help you to not be so fault-finding. Um, if you are the sort of negative type, again, meta meditation is recommended. The Buddha said for aversive types, meta is great. There are also types who, look, we all have aversion, we all have delusion, we all have greed. It's just that some of these traits are stronger than others in us, and that may change over time. Um... For greed types, it's good to focus more on um, like the unsatisfactory nature of things. If there's a lot of lust and passion that comes up around things, then um, you can even focus on like the ugliness of things. And for the delusion types, I think analysis, analysis, learning, reading, discussing with wise people. So that might be a good idea. I mean, I would like to give you the benefit of the doubt also and think that perhaps those partners weren't the right ones, you know, because if they were, they might have been able to help you. So it's not all your fault if something's not worked out. <laughs> <laughs> Probably you're a woman. Women always think it's their fault. <laughs> Sorry, that's, is that sexist? <laughs> but it's true. Uh, I would like to know how to eliminate the feeling of discontent. I mean, be careful of words like eliminate because that sort of suggests that you're quite averse to the feeling of discontent and we do have to learn to approach the discontent and sort of experience it, first of all, before we push it away. In fact, we're not supposed to push it away at all. It's just understanding how and when it's arising. How, why, when, under what circumstances does it arise? You know, the mind's moved from a place of peace and contentment due to something. So something has struck at your mind, probably a negative thought, and the mind's moved into discontent. So the first thing is to accept it. I mean, it's like we've been practicing, you know, try and make peace with that thought. So have a little bit of distance from it and see, am I adding fuel to the fire by saying, I don't want this, go away? Or am I able to just like look upon that discontent with the eyes of kindness? You know, like a mother would look upon a child or like a teacher would look at you or a good friend would look at you mm. with a lot of care and concern. And it's like a strange thing to try and talk about, but it works. It's like you have your mindfulness and that notices the discontent. But because you have that connection through mindfulness, you can kind of somehow channel a sense of kindness and warmth. You just have to get into the mode of it and also remember to do it. I mean, it's impossible to always do it, but once you get used to doing it, it becomes easier and easier. And when you do that, the kindness and the quality with which you're observing the discontent tends to almost take over because the mind's very powerful. So that's why it's called making good mental karma. You know, you're actually responding to something which is unpleasant with an attitude of love and acceptance and patience. And so those qualities of the mind start to grow. So it's really helpful to get into that way of practice. 
And that's what I'm trying to convey. I mean, it's, it's a, yeah, it takes getting the knack of, because <laughs> we are conditioned. So be patient with yourself. If you're just getting started in your practice and in the Buddhist path, what are some tips and suggestions for foundations? Virtuous behaviour. How about that? And come to meditation <laughs> retreats like this, like a weekend retreat at the Buddhist empty cloud. <laughs> or the empty cloud of Buddhist insights. So I think you're doing the right thing. But foundations, to me, suggest strong ethical foundations. They're the best. Um, and sometimes if you're not able to do that, then you probably need to see uh, why not. And so for that, you need more mindfulness. So for that, meditation helps. So meditation... Sila, wisdom, they all revolve around each other and strengthen each other. So the Eightfold Path it is actually sequential, it says so in the texts. But it's more like, rather than being linear, it's more like a hoop, like a circle. So you go through it linearly, but then it hoops back round. So once you've sort of got a bit of everything, a little bit, basic level, then your basic level feeds into right view again, and then it's strengthened a bit more, and then that's a little bit more than basic, and it keeps on feeding. So just keep going. You're doing good. If you've written the question and you're still here, then you've not left the retreat. <laughs> Do we teach the most difficult ones, the Donald Trumps? <laughs> <laughs> he is le legion, legion? Uh, or stay in the community of the like-minded? <laughs> I'd definitely rather stay here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't fancy going to the White House to meet Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, we have to strengthen ourselves first, you know. The Buddha said that wise companionship is a whole of the spiritual life. And the reason for that is because we're conditioned entities, not beings, actually. We're conditioned processors, let's say. You know, it's like the things that I'm telling you. If you listen to Ajahn Brahm, you'll see that he says exactly the same things. I mean, probably not exactly, because I'm probably... a grossly under-representing him. But a lot of the things I've picked up, are, well, all of the things I've picked up are from my own life experiences, from the books I've read, from my teachers, right? I mean, where else have I got anything from? <laughs> We're completely conditioned. So it's really important to seek like-minded communities and wise friends to be around most of the time. And then if you're resourced enough, you can go out and do activism, you know, maybe you want to do political activism or climate activism or help the homeless or, you know, um, be an ally for the LGBTQIA plus community or be an ally for women or other marginalised groups. What are other marginalised groups? People of colour. Whoever, you know, you need to first strengthen yourself and then you can do some of that. I mean, the Buddha taught us not to go out and missionize. Is that the right word? We had this discussion already. Uh, Prothelitize, is that right? Um, and I think one of the reasons is because some people just are not ready to hear the Dhamma. And it may be the case for somebody like Donald Trump. So the best thing we can do is look at him and say, well, I don't want to live like that. <laughs> How can I make sure that those... Um, I don't know what to say. I mean, whatever it is you see in him which you don't appreciate, how can you make sure that you don't develop and generate that kind of harm in yourself and towards others? Yeah? So we take examples from the wise and from the unwise. What we want to be and what we don't want to be. Some people like Donald Trump. They see things in him to admire. And it's, I mean, I did practice with him a little bit with the difficult person during my meta retreat, but I waited until my meta was strong enough. <laughs> but remember, it's not to change him, it's to change ourselves. And that way we change our immediate communities. We can't change the world, but communities impact other communities, which impact others, so like this, it starts to spread. What could be a good practice for an anxious attack with biting nails thank you mm. if it's really an anxiety attack I had one once or twice I don't know if it was full-fledged but you know what happened was that um, another nun who's a friend 
she saw me and she put her arm around me and she marched me up and down the street. It was great. She put her arm around me really strongly and she walked with me backwards and forwards until I calmed down. It was really great, I must say. So I think when we're anxious like that, it's um, good if you can have a friend who can just be there with you. I don't know why that came to mind. I mean, of course, there are probably things you can do on your cushion. I don't know. It depends how strong it is. I mean, this sounds more like nerves than anything. But I do think walking meditation can be quite useful in this kind of case. Because if you are biting your nails, then you're a bit too agitated to be sitting down and just watching that. I mean, yeah, you could put your nails, like, bandage them up or something, or put something around your neck, but that's kind of crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Because obviously the sensations are too difficult for you to be still with, right? So I think... I don't know, or you could put yourself in bed and tuck yourself up and have a hot water bottle or have a nice warm bath or have a nice hot chocolate. Just really look after yourself at that time. Hmm? And if, yeah, you want to be with yourself, if you feel strong enough to like look into it, maybe do some more active meditation like walking. Lying down is also probably not a bad idea. Like if you could do the Shavasana, I mean, we can do that in Buddhist terms. It's a yoga practice, but it's basically just scanning the body and intentionally relaxing it part by part. Yeah. And again, looking upon it with kindly eyes. I hope that helps a bit. Sometimes we just have to wait for these things to calm. But yeah, being in a safe space is important, I think. That's why it's good, you know, to either like look after yourself like go to bed or whatever or have a friend there because then you're held because I think when you're anxious the tendency is to like just want to run and then you're sort of quite vulnerable at that time will you do any retreat programs for mums, kids and toddlers I guess that is a question to the empty cloud and someone asked the empty cloud folks that the other day and I think they did say that they may do I think that was about teens actually But I think anything is possible with this place. So if you put that in the suggestion box, um, I'm sure they will take it up. So why haven't I answered this? Maybe I was... Are we all right? Last question. Mm -hmm. How to practice contentment but still invite in more abundance? Mm. Yeah, but if you're content, whatever you have starts to look abundant. You're not losing out by being content. So this question to me, I haven't read it all, but it tells me that you don't think contentment is rich. Mm. Mm. The thing with contentment is that you start off saying, okay, this is okay, I'm content with it, it's good, it's good enough. But when you really see that it it really is good enough, it starts to look really good. Like it starts to grow (laughs) in your mind because you're valuing it. And then it starts to open up. Because every experience is only a matter of our perception. There's nothing innately wonderful about the breath. But the more we stay with it, the more it opens up to us and the more beautiful it starts to look. It's not that it's actually changing. It's just that our minds are seeing more deeply into it and staying with it for longer without craving. So if you want to have more abundance, (laughs) that's a kind of craving. Real contentment is absolutely satisfied because it really is everything you could want you don't want there's nothing missing at all you're absolutely satiated yeah so don't worry about not having abundance you'll feel richer than the richest person in the world I think in the suttas it says contentment is the highest wealth so contentment is something really powerful there's different stages of it just like there are different stages of mindfulness so let it grow and then you'll be Abundant in contentment, is that possible? (laughs) Okay. I know in my moments here, I know the feeling in my of my cup runneth over. I know in my moments here, I know the joy of feeling my cup runneth over. That's nice. But at home, close ones say I must have limiting beliefs if I have difficulty with money, attracting the right relationships, getting in my own way, etc. Yeah, that might be just because of societal pressure. I mean, maybe you're okay with not having too much money. I don't know. 
I feel content, but I wish to invite abundance of love, finances and resources. I don't know, isn't that a contradiction? Um, I know, check out how much that's really you wanting that, and or whether that's sort of a bit of societal family pressure there. Because if you really are content, I think you will attract those things. At least you'll attract love. Resources, you're content, so for you that's enough. <laughs> I mean, you know, I've lived in India on £20 a week and I, I really did live like almost like a local, sometimes worse than a local. <laughs> you know, eating all the local food, just sleeping on mud floors. And I was incredibly content and I had no idea of anything else being abundant than that. I actually thought the other things were kind of yucky. You know, I was in nature. I was so close to nature. I'd just go outside and there were the Himalayas, you know. It was fantastic. And, you know, once I was trekking in Ladakh in the Himalayas and uh, Mm. (laughs) we took some, I don't know, some oats and some pasta and some dried apricots because we couldn't carry that much stuff. It was just tents and sleeping bags and these things and a kerosene stove. And the kerosene leaked all over the beautiful dried apricots and all over everything, actually. Mm. So we didn't have very much to eat and we'd walk 15 kilometres up thousands of metres because to sort of ascend a 1,000 metres in a day, you have to ascend 500, go down 400, go up 300, go down 200. It's like you keep going up and down, up and down. So it's exhausting. And then we got to this village, which was quite high altitude, um, and we went to a house because people are so hospitable. You just go there and you ask, you know. And they made this meal and it was potatoes boiled in rice, rice boiled in pot- with potatoes and some turmeric and some salt. And it was divine food. It was the most delicious meal i had had. I ate two huge plates of it and it just tasted wonderful. Really wonderful. Because if you really are content and you don't expect much, then whatever you get is just a total blessing. There was another time I was in India um, studying Pali and my friend from France came over and stayed for a while in the centre. And it was her 30th birthday, I think. And uh, there we just had, you know, everyday dal and rice and some vegetables. Um, and then for somehow or other we had hold of some sweets, some little boiled sweets. And she opened a sweet on her birthday and she said, we were just all so happy to be together, you know, and to have this little sweet. And she said, I'm 30 years old and I'm so content with one sweet. And it was like a real celebration of her life. She really felt like genuinely happy and delighted with it. So that's what real abundance is. It's not material stuff. Material stuff is so complicated. Imagine if you had a big house and, you know, loads of rooms to clean and, I don't know, gates to have to lock every day. Because once you have a big house, you have to have padlocks and guards and dogs and everything. And it's just, (laughs) you know, it's just a nightmare. So if you have enough and you start to appreciate what you have, that will grow in your mind. And you may find it grows externally, but it won't matter. Yes, I thought it was about New Age philosophy. It sends one through a lot of visualisation. Hoopla! I'm happy being simply content, but the problem remains. I don't think there's a problem. I actually don't think there's a problem here. Just don't read that New Age stuff or take this societal pressure. You sound quite content. Perhaps it's just about having a bit more confidence in that and in the path that you're on. So good luck. I hope that was informative, entertaining and helpful.